even the coffee isn't helping me at this point. I mean, it's helping. I'd rather be with it than without it. I can't really feel it anymore. I'm numb. Honestly, props to anybody that makes YouTube videos. They're a lot harder than I imagined. Okay. How are you, YouTube? That's great. So today, I'm going to be reacting to a classical violinist, reacting to a contemporary violinist, and I am a contemporary cellist. I know that's getting a little meta, but that's what we're doing today. So I don't know who this YouTuber is. It's not really important because it's not really about her specifically. It's just about some of the things that she's said. For a little context about who I am, I'm a contemporary cellist. I've been playing the cello for 14 years. I played the violin for five years before that. I have toured internationally. I've headlined in Australia. I'm classically trained within a conservatorium environment majoring in cello performance. And I've also studied composition with a major in songwriting and a particular focus on British folk song and balladry. So that's where I'm coming from with this. Let's just get started. Hey guys, welcome back to a new episode of Violence Reacts. So today we're going to be watching a Lindsay Sterling video. If you don't know her, she is a violinist who dances. At least that's all I know. <laughs> so okay. So yeah, I'm not really surprised that it's that it's Lindsay Sterling who's the focus of this reaction video. Lindsay Sterling is somebody who's had a lot of criticism leveled at her over the years for the fact that she dances and plays, which is no small feat, you know. I implore you, if you think this is something to make light of, to give it a try. It's not that easy to do. It's something that people seem to believe is gimmicky or, you know, novel and therefore less legitimate. More than that, Lindsay Sterling is a commercially successful artist. She's been doing this for a very long time. You may not value commercial success and that's fine. It doesn't delegitimize a person's music. This is an idea that is leveled at artists across the board a lot, that you're a sellout if music or commercial success are involved. And I think artists really are shortchanging themselves when they perpetuate those attitudes. The industry is oversaturated. The industry is forever placing downward pressure on artists and our fees, and we're helping them when we perpetuate attitudes like this. It's a shame, to be honest. So we're going to watch Brown Table Rival. I've got it right here, and I am super excited to see what's going on. Also, a little disclaimer. <laughs> I'm a classical violinist. She is not. There's nothing wrong with what she does, but it's also kind of my job as a classical violinist to make fun of her. So that's <laughs> it's not your job as a as a classical violinist to make fun of anybody and it's interesting that you've prefaced that comment with the fact that you're a classical musician as a classical violinist your job description the entirety of your job description is to play classical repertoire on the violin I could be really generous here and assume that she's being lighthearted for the sake of the video, and she may well be. She may not be malicious in making that statement, but I'm taking issue with it because it is a prevalent attitude within the classical space. There's this idea that a hierarchy exists where there is none, where classical Western art music is at the top of that hierarchy, and contemporary music and other genres are below. And that's problematic for a lot of reasons, apart from not being rooted in any kind of reality. When you take classical music and you consider it to be the baseline, the standard from which all judgments about other forms of music spring, you delegitimize other forms of music. Those other forms of music are legitimate art forms completely outside of the classical sphere. It's problematic because most people on this planet do not have the prerequisite requirement of privilege to engage in classical music. They just don't. There are a lot of barriers to access. Those are social and those are financial, and the financial ones are particularly problematic, as well as gatekeeping. Just as a cellist myself, as an example, if you want to purchase a cello, a beginner instrument up to intermediate, they will cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. They are not inexpensive instruments to own or play or maintain. I can only speak for the Australian market, but if you wish to purchase a set of professional cello strings in Australia, they will set you back five to six hundred dollars for a set of four strings. And the recommendation ideally is that you replace those strings every six to twelve months. It's very expensive, and that's not taking into account tuition costs. It's not taking into account all of the other things you need to play the instrument, accessories. 
sheet music and written resources and all of those other things. I'm not necessarily saying that this is what she believes, but this attitude of, you know, I'm a classical musician and therefore I'm going to judge other musicians does reinforce this hierarchy. So let's start watching. There she is with her violin in the wild, wild west. Won't the violin get really sandy? Oh, I see. It's not much violin left over. <laughs> okay. She's saying that there's not much violin left over. Lindsay Sterling is playing an electric violin here. I will insert a picture here of what that is. It's essentially the equivalent of a solid bodied guitar, which is an electric instrument. So the way that these instruments operate, the way that they produce sound is fundamentally different to how an acoustic instrument produces sound. On an acoustic instrument, the way that the sound is produced is via the sound chamber, the sound box, you know, the hollow body of the instrument. On an electric violin, like what Lindsay Sterling is playing, the way that the sound is produced is via the vibrations of the strings, but that vibration, rather than being amplified by the sound box, is being amplified by a piezo pickup in most cases. A piezo pickup is a kind of pickup, a amplification method, that just picks up the pure vibration and amplifies it through an amplifier, such as this one. It's not dependent on natural resonance. There's no resonance really involved here. That's why there appears to be not much of it. I mean, it's a logical choice, given the kind of venues that she plays. It's a logical choice for contemporary music. Um, I don't know if this is a kind of purity ideal here, that most people would play a acoustic instrument. And, you know, I play an acoustic instrument with onboard electronics. I don't play an electric instrument. That's just a personal choice. It doesn't make it any better or any worse than playing an electronic violin like this. But there are many reasons why a musician, especially a contemporary musician, would choose to use an electric violin. In the case of someone like Lindsay Sterling, she plays large venues, she plays loud venues. When you play an electric instrument like this, you're cutting down on the potential for feedback, for example, which is created more often by instruments that are acoustic, that have that resonating chamber. And the applications of an instrument of this nature, an electric violin, are very different to the applications of a, an, an acoustic violin, so. Little violin lesson. If you want a lot of sound, play here. If you don't want a lot of sound, play here. Where is she playing? Here, nobody plays there. That's terrible. Anyway. Um, that's not really how that works. It's very lacking in nuance to just say that Playing up here is bad and playing down here is good. It's just not really the case. Ideally, in doing a reaction like this, we would be reacting to a live performance by Lindsay Sterling. All of this sound that you're hearing is added back in in post-production. So nobody on this set is actually playing an instrument. They probably have a reference track to mime to. Everything you're hearing is those musicians in the studio at a later date creating the track and then they introduce that in post-production. So that's how that works. So we can't really judge her playing technique based on a contrived, you know, art piece video like this. We can't because she's not, she's not actually playing. Let me grab my cello real quick and I'll show you. So this is the mighty cello. This here is called the bridge. This forms an end point for the strings, one end point for the strings. The other end point here is the nut. This is the nut. Although the strings extend beyond the bridge and beyond the nut, the functional string length that we have available to us to create sound is between those two endpoints. If I stop my string, for example, up here where the neck joins the body, I am basically halving my available string length in doing that. My finger is basically becoming the nut of the instrument now. Everything above where my finger is stopping the string is now irrelevant, so it's not something that we can use in producing sound. On an acoustic instrument like this, this is an acoustic instrument that I'm playing, when you stop the string far down like this or further down like this, your bow does correspondingly need to move down because this instrument, as I said, is dependent on resonance within this sound box here to create sound. 
the most resonant place to play on the string will change dependent on where you stop the string with your fingers, with your left hand. That is the case for an acoustic instrument like this. However, it's not really the case for an electric violin like what Lindsay Sterling is playing. As I touched on before, because her instrument is not dependent on resonance to produce sound, it's dependent on vibration and the piezo pickup, where her bow is when she plays, within reason, is not as critical as it is when you're playing an acoustic instrument because the piezo pickup is still going to pick up that vibration whether you're here or here. And really, aside from that, there's a lot more nuance to bowing. Bow positioning is dynamic. It changes depending on what you're playing, where you're stopping the strings, but it also changes depending on what kind of effect you're seeking to create with your bowing and with your bow positioning. If I wanted to create a sound on the cello that had very strong harmonic overtones to the point that the fundamental tone I'm playing is somewhat broken up in sound by the presence of those overtones, I'm going to bow right down close to my bridge because there are harmonics down there that I know I can access to create that sound. But if I want to create a beautiful pure tone on the cello, I'm going to move my bow up and I'm going to aim for somewhere between the end of the fingerboard, this, this black board here on the cello, and the bridge because I know that this is a really resonant place that's unhindered sound, it's very pure in tone. And as she has said, it is louder, but you don't necessarily always want to be louder. You don't always necessarily want a pure tone. So it really depends on what are you trying to create on the instrument. By the same token, you know, in regards to what she said about Lindsay's playing, even though she's not really playing this instrument, but it is not accurate to say that it's not done that you bow over the fingerboard. If you want a glossy, translucent kind of sound, something softer and less forceful, you'll play over the, the fingerboard. It's not like it's not allowed. You are allowed to play there. My attitude towards playing is that there's no such thing as a bad sound. The only bad sound or bad playing is the playing that you don't intend, is the sound that you are not intentionally creating, because that would imply that you have a lack of control over your instrument. Regardless of what the sound is, if it's the sound that you're intending to create, it's the perfect sound. It really depends on what you want. The harmonics of the bridge is something that I utilize a lot in my playing. I also utilize the beautiful, natural, unhindered sound of the cello. You know, it really just depends on the piece. So kind of ignoring the nuance of, of bowing here by just saying, this is where you play and this is where you don't play, so. Wait, so it's like a battle between the violin with a trumpet on it and the guitars? It's not a violin with a trumpet attachment, it's a stro violin. As we've kind of discussed, Lindsay Sterling is playing an electric instrument here, so this brass instrument bell, essentially, is just decorative for these purposes. And again, she's not really, you know, playing what you're hearing in this clip, it's post-production. They tend to be louder than the standard violin because there is this extra outlet for the resonance and the timbre is a little different because that sound is now escaping through a metal chamber. You know, it's not some wacky thing that they've just created for this video. It is an instrument that also exists. I mean, she's not really playing the music. Yeah, she's not. She's not really playing the music because this is a film clip that you are reacting to. It's not a live performance, so... It's not really relevant, you know? It's not really relevant. This is very strange. But sound waves don't attack anyone. Oh my god. This is set in a western shootout kind of setting. And, you know, the concept here is that the instruments are the weapons and the sound waves are the bullets. Very basic music as well, but it's kind of fun. Okay. All right, I'm gonna need you to quantify what basic means. That could mean anything. What do you mean by basic? Do you mean that this song is harmonically simple or melodically simple? or something that you don't believe is particularly complex in nature. It's interesting that you've said basic but fun. 
kind of insinuates that the basic here is a negative. I'd love to know why it's a negative that music is what you deem to be basic and what you mean by basic, uh, you know, at all. <laughs> to say that this is basic, you know, and I don't necessarily take pleasure in saying this, but it's kind of intellectually lazy to say that this music is basic. More than that, though, to say that this music is basic is to lack an understanding about where this music is coming from. This is a pop representation of the style she's drawing from, but that style is Irish folk music. This may not read as complex to you. That would imply to me that you don't necessarily have an understanding of the history of this music. Traditional folk music has a rich history, rich musical history. It's some of the oldest music on the planet, some of the oldest music that we have. And this particular song is drawing on Irish folk music. Irish folk music features a lot of embellishments in playing style. Often drones are used because these songs are composed in modes, which are different in character to the scales often used in classical music. Very often, for example, Irish music is composed in Dorian mode. It's a really different character to the sound and it's something that is recognizable as folk music when we use these modes. They're often referred to as church modes. Because folk music is so old, the storytelling within the songs, you know, particularly in some of the most famous ballads, is very effective and very distilled. It's very compelling music and it's very universal and compelling storytelling. In my opinion, it's some of the most effective storytelling through song that we have. So to say that something like this is basic, to me just shows that you maybe don't have the education required to understand the tradition from which this music springs. And more disappointingly than that, maybe that you don't have the willingness to seek that education out, because it's certainly available. If you would like to know more about folk music, I really implore you to look at the child ballads. They're a collection of British ballads that were essentially archived by Francis Child, who they're named for. You can also look at the Raud Folk Index, which is a fantastic resource for folk song in Britain. It's easy to say that something is basic when you don't understand it, as though it's somehow flippant or, you know, lacking in substance. These are incredible songs, and to say that they are basic is unfortunately a shallow reading of the tradition of these countries and of this music. Who's gonna teach me how to dance like that? Then we can make a real video. A real video? What does that mean? It's fine. Oh no! Well done, Lindsay. I've seen enough. I'm, I'm done with it. So yeah, that's my reaction. That's how I feel about that. There is this tendency to be kind of exclusionary and elitist among classical musicians in the classical space. I think it's unfortunate because it's not necessary. And as I kind of said, it assumes that we all value the same things in music. Within the classical sphere, technical proficiency is really valued. In other genres of music, soulfulness and the ability to tell a story is valued. There's no reason why we need to pit these two elements against each other. And honestly, I feel like at this point in time, it's really boring <laughs> to do this. There's no reason that we need to continue to say that this form of music is better than this form of music. They all fit. I don't know what else to say about it. We don't need to compete and we don't need to pit genres against each other. It's not necessary. So that's it. Thank you if you made it this far in the video for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe below if you would like to do that. I'll probably have a video somewhat soon. Thanks, guys.